the script and broke the mold that was holding me back from taking flight now i'm doing okay yeah i'm doing all right welcome and thanks for listening this is voices amped i'm ellie clark and i'm vanessa becker weig and we are your hosts we are super excited to introduce you to another member of our leadership team, Dr. Margaret McGladry. Margaret is originally from Salem, Oregon. She has been living in Lexington, Kentucky for more than 10 years after her partner's work as a professor of Chinese brought them to Lexington. Margaret is an applied sociologist who received her PhD in sociology and gender and women's studies from University of Kentucky in 2018, studying part-time while working full-time as the assistant dean for research in the UK College of Public Health for six years. After competing a postdoctoral fellowship with the Tisch School of Civic Life at Tufts University, Dr. McGladry was named the inaugural director of program capacity and support for CASA, the Kentucky Court Appointed Special Advocates Network, responsible for the program evaluation and quality assurance activities of local CASA programs. CASA trains and guides community volunteers to advocate for their best interests of abused and neglected children in Kentucky family courts. Margaret is the research and advocacy director for the Girl Project. Her work involves youth-led participatory action research with the Girl Project. She is responsible for the foot program's feminist critical pedagogy and grant writing and evaluations. She created the cross peer mentoring program for the girl projects middle school aged participants, the girl project next generation. Her research has been published in peer reviewed journals such as signs journal of women in culture and society feminist formations, the journal of the national women's studies association journal of children and media cultural trends, America Journal of Health Education, and Journal of Black Sexuality and Relationships. She is a certified teacher of Kundalini Yoga and has been teaching mindfulness, meditation, and yoga classes in community and school settings for more than 15 years. Margaret's parents were the music ministers for her church growing up, so she has been making sacred music for as long as she can remember, in addition to contributing to her church social justice and children and youth ministries. After falling in love with the Episcopal Church during her time at Tufts, Margaret entered the discernment process to become ordained as a deacon, whose role is to serve as the church's prophetic voice to carry Margaret entered the discernment process to become ordained as a deacon whose role is to serve as the church's prophetic voice to care for the poor, the weak, the sick, and the lonely. Margaret made the difficult decision to leave paid work for CASA this fall after being recruited back to UK as the project director for two institutional research initiatives. The first involves developing a pilot program to prepare for a huge grant application to the National Institutes of Health, NIH, to recruit and retain underrepresented minority faculty in biomedical and behavioral science research. The second is managing the implementation of opiate overdose prevention and treatment practices in criminal justice settings as part of the biggest grant UK has ever received the Healing Community Studies. Margaret is the mother of many furry animal babies, dogs, cats. Uh, we refer to her as the rock crusher, and um, it's because she's fierce and wickedly intelligent. And um, you can tell by the bio I just read. <laughs> she is a Virgo. Virgos are practical, loyal, analytical, hardworking, always knowing exactly where to look for the core of any problem. My mother's a Virgo. I think they're a little hard on themselves sometimes too. They set high expectations of themselves. So um, you sound incredibly busy, Margaret. 
Uh, is that true? Did I miss anything in your bio? What did I, what did I mispronounce or say wrong? No, you did, you did wonderfully, Ellie. <laughs> and hearing it all in kind of narrative form out of the voice of someone I love is just like, oh, really? That's me? Really? <laughs> I don't, I don't know about that. Um, so it's, it's interesting too, how much like that, that list of the things that I've been doing, right? Uh, is kind of a misrepresentation of what 2020 has been for me, which has been really about being, you know, and getting into a space of holding space for myself. And um, so, yeah, it's, it, it feels like a lot of doing and upon reflection, but man, it's, it's, it's felt like a lot more being uh, for the last year or so. And that's, that's been really cool and an unexpected gift of 2020, I think, for yeah. probably not me, not just me, but other people too. Absolutely. And I think, um, I think our leadership team for uh, Voices Amplified, formerly known as The Girl Project, are very busy people. We like, we're action oriented. We like to stay busy. Um, I particularly think of you that way, how fast your mind moves, how, how much your workload always seems like a lot to me. You have your hands in so many places trying to help so many people. So has the pandemic been hard for you to slow down and give yourself space to be moving at a different pace? Or have you been moving just as fast as you're becoming a deacon and still working on your mindfulness practice? Like, what has it been like? I would say it has been both faster and slower in interesting ways. And I, I really, I, like, I will always make a plug in any opportunity I can to explore mindfulness practice if that's not already a part of your life, because I think it gave me the familiarity and comfort with being in the being space uh, that prepared me to be able to shift gears and change my tempo, change my pace, because the world had slowed down. But I also think, you know, as much as I've kind of maybe decelerated around the doing and really tried to settle into and center into how I can make connections among those doings, right? Um, and really, uh, really create some sustainability for myself. Um, that's, that's a big thing. But it's also just um, feeling like the acceleration has happened for me on maybe a spiritual level, feeling like when I give myself the time and the opportunity to cultivate a relationship with myself and my sense of the divine, different blocks around my thinking and imagination and ideas about what's, what, what I need and what stories I buy into. Of course, obviously from what the bio you just read off, a big part of my life has been professional accomplishments and <laughs> you know, building the CV and all of this kind of stuff and sounding yeah. impressive. Um, and, you know, as part of the last couple of years, that's, that's really a lot of that, the, the high that comes with those different ego hits has really changed for me um, going into the pandemic. So that's been, I, I think it's been really good to feel like my sources of energy are coming because they're not coming from my external environments. Oh, I'm not getting the head pats. I'm not getting all of the, that fun juice from my environment that is still like good and healthy and wonderful to be in, engaged in that kind of dynamism. But I feel like all of it has gone kind of maybe up for me um, instead, mm -hmm. which is, is really kind of cool. Um, so I feel like I'm both, I've kind of slowed down maybe from the outside, but on the inside, my mind is just like, absorbing and making so many different kinds of, of connections. Um, and as you read something like the deacon role too, I was actually just talking with a good friend about this is like, that's the kind of role that transcends what you do. It's what you are. Um, and it's not even a process of being like discerned or going into a particular church or, or whatever. But once you can get to a sense in your life of fulfilling your purpose of why you were created at this time and this place, with these people, right, and the, the folks that you're with, it's, it's a really, um, it, it's been a cool redefinition of identity around a different kind of role than what I, I think our culture very much obsesses around, this productivity obsession. And I think this pandemic has been like a big um, reframe for folks like me who have gotten a lot of our hits in the past from being on that hustle cycle, you know? Um, yeah. I wonder, uh, Vanessa's been talking to me quite a bit about 
her meditation recently. And I know you have been talking about it in terms of mindfulness. Can you tell me and listeners, are those one and the same? Are they different? Is your mindfulness your meditation? So I'll tell you a little bit about some of the different ways you can think about this. And one is something I really love from the Episcopal tradition, the broader Anglican tradition, which is this idea of the rule of life. So this is kind of the the practices and intentions that you set for yourself to create a rhythm in your day through what you do that helps you to reorient toward your priorities. And of course, in the case of religious practice, it's to reorient toward your divine source and, and a sense of, of kind of committed love, to, a lo committed loving relationship to who you think about as God and the people around you. So um, with a rule of life, it includes a lot of different things. It includes how you spend your money, it includes how you spend your time, and it includes how you're using prayer and meditation throughout your day. So that's been a really interesting thing for me to reflect on the difference between mindfulness, which I would see as how you apply your consciousness of the fact that you're conscious, right? The fact that as we can be in our lives, unlike animals, right? We have our prefrontal cortex, which allows us to actually reflect on our, what we're doing and how I can use that capacity for being within, but also outside myself throughout my day's rhythms, especially my work, that's mindfulness to me. Meditation for me is the dedicated practices I have throughout my day. And with my rule of life in uh, the discernment process, that's praying three times a day, meditating basically three times a day. But I do a big sit in the morning, 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes before bed. And that's meditation for me because I am not trying to balance mindfulness and the consciousness I develop in meditation with my daily doings. That's mindfulness. Meditation is when I'm taking the time to remove all of those distractions. In fact, I think mindfulness is probably more challenging in some ways than meditation for me at this point where I've been doing a, you know, kind of a meditation practice every day because meditation is so much easier, right? You're just, you're creating an ideal circumstance. And additionally, the cutest thing about my pand the pandemic, you guys, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, is my cat, my tabby cat. He loves to meditate with me because <laughs> it's an upstairs room. My prayer room is an upstairs room. He doesn't usually get to go into because there's stuff he knocks off and all that kind of stuff. So he comes and he hangs out with me and it's this cool little time. And so that, that feels like, you know, how to cultivate this kind of consciousness in an ideal circumstance that you create for yourself, whatever that environment looks like. I think that's another important thing too, is like mindfulness is how we apply those learnings to all of our environments. But meditation for me, as Vanessa was saying before we got started here, you know, she lights a candle, she has her tea going into the, the different kinds of rituals and the spaces that you can create for yourself, your little altars. And, you know, mine definitely includes, I have girl project stuff. I have a picture of me and my grandma all of the different um, ways that you can create kind of a sacred space in your own home, I think is also a part of meditation, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I got really wordy in my interview talking about some of the best advice I've ever been given. And uh, unconscious unconsciousness and conscious consciousness and unconscious consciousness, like this idea of practice will bring um, your consciousness uh, just happening daily um, and being having having that consciousness daily of how you're moving through your day and making the choices um, and those good parts of it becoming habits you know that we are trying to generate for ourselves um, so as I move into more of our work together um, you me Vanessa Jenny why, why girl studies? You, you, we, you know, talked about your PhD and I know in undergrad, you were studying, studying journalism. Um, and then for your PhD, you moved into sociology and women and gender studies. So why did the shift happen? Um, and, and why did you change that pursuit? I think it really corresponds with my own, in my development and healing from an eating disorder and anorexia, right? So when I was beginning my studies in undergrad, I was still very much in 
the throes of uh, performance oriented, uh, uh, like stage persona, right? So in addition to my parents being music ministers, they also were uh, both uh, musical directors, right? So I was in, I was a state theater kid, right? And that's always been part of my, of course, attraction to what we do in the Girl Project and just the opportunity to be in a theater and on stage and in that environment feels like, like home to me in a lot of ways. So, you know, I think when I was initially, initially exploring what I could study and I wanted to find different kinds of ways to, as I was grappling with how impactful media imagery and cultural kind of ideologies were in my own kind of navigation of basically the journey through puberty, I really think about my eating disorder as like my experience of being like, oh my gosh, all of the, what's out there for adult women in the United States sucks. I don't want any of that, right? Mm. I can be pretty, but then I'm not smart and I can be, you know, smart, but then I will like, you know, a, like no man will ever want me and I'll never have a fan. Like all of these, the double standards, I think like just short circuited me. So journalism school was my first step in maybe kind of thinking about how I could be of service to people through my experiences, but I was still very much in kind of the throes of the eating disorder, really making my decision to heal and choose something different with my life energy. So journalism, at first I was doing like TV news and a lot of like being on screen and all that kind of stuff and thinking about, like I did like internships at a TV station in Accra, Ghana, where I was doing like uh, African dance and um, all kinds of like, again, performance kind of oriented stuff. I did a couple of local TV internships. It was interesting, but I also just like discovered something that I really wish again, and thinking, I think about Girl Project so much as the kind of environment that would have been so healing and important to me at that stage in my life. And I think back, like, you know, what if I would have heard from folks that instead of, hey, have you ever thought of being a model? You're so tall and pretty and all that kind of stuff. Have you ever thought about being a writer? Have you ever thought about being, thought about being a sociologist? Because, I mean, I was a boss-ass writer. I was like, you know, the top like salutatorian in my high school, crazy, like I was a high academic achiever. I never got the message that any of that like mattered, right? So it was in journalism school that I started to be like, get some validation for my writing and see that, that the storytelling that could be done there. So I really think about journalism as kind of applied social sciences, the first draft of history, of course, as we know, right? But it's also where I really honed my chops with um, interviewing folks, uh, gathering and vetting different kinds of sources of information, all the kind of media literacy stuff that we could do with the Girl Project was journalism school. We had a class called uh, InfoHell, right? Where we had to, it was my first big research paper, annotated 200 different kinds of sources and all this kind of stuff. And so it really was, but it wasn't just for academia's sake, right? It was for telling the stories of different kinds of people. So I eventually settled on magazine journalism. So I got some of the performative stuff and all of mm -hmm. my, you know, my dream to be like, you know, the, the models in the magazines, right? I get that kind of imagery, but also the writing stuff. Um, so it was very much developmental for me. Um, and then in, as I continued, you know, my first step of my career, I uh, really got into um, uh, yoga teaching as part of my healing process. Um, I, I wanted to bring uh, some of the things that were helpful to me in media literacy as well as mindfulness uh, to my studies, right? So like my eating disorder, I always say like feminism and, uh, and uh, yoga were what, uh, feminism healed my mind, yoga healed my body. And mm -hmm. um, so in kind of my experiences with feminist writing at the end of undergrad and going forward, I was like, this is it, right? I, I've got to get these ideas out there. I'm a writer, I know media. So I, I went to my master's program in communication. Um, but as I dug into this study, and I would hope that would happen for everyone as they progress in their intellectual development and their, their own creative exploration of, I, I was really, I mean, I really put kind of my whole self into what I was studying, right? Everything I was studying was about the questions I had about my own social psychology, who I was, who, what this world was around me, all of these roles, right? And I thought media studies was where I could figure it out because that's where the portrayals are, right? You have all the images, all the representations. But like, as I started taking different classes in various departments, sociology is where you get to kind of the root cause stuff of the, 
white supremacist hetero patriarchy, right? And, and you can get to why these images are as controlling as they, they are um, beyond kind of the, the media studies angle. So that's, that's where, it, as I kind of developed in, in my own um, recovery and also kind of my commitment to transform that recovery into some kind of meaningful advocacy, it was about getting to that root cause stuff. And it just took me a while. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, so what was it like to jump fields and go into research and science? And it, 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 were you hyper aware that you were a female presence in the research and science world? Were you, did that feel different? Because I, I think of, you know, a journalist having to be put together and look a certain way and be super smart and, you know, um, be very knowledgeable, intellectual, but in research and science, uh, maybe there's a different expectation there. How, how did that feel to be a woman going into that field? I think I will take this from an intersectional perspective because I think my femininity combined with my age and how young I read mm. makes it very difficult to be in a position of true authority, especially where, because I was working in throughout grad school, um, all my skills in journalism, and this is for any of you, you folks out there who, especially young folks who might be thinking about whether writing is a useful thing to develop, the fact that I could write and edit meant that I could write proposals first for a civil engineering firm and then for all of my professors for their research grants, right? So it's a, it's a pretty cool applied skill set when you get down to it. Um, but in these spaces where you're actually playing with you know, the real power, and this was very, I mean, my parents are both like very middle class music teachers, my family's all firefighters, teachers, nurses, right? Academia and the class difference on top of the age thing, right? So I was coming from very middle class, like not socialized into this at all. And academia is all about, you know, you have kind of like a legacy, right, of who your advisor is, all this kind of stuff. I knew none of that cultural capital kind of stuff at all. And plus, I read as young and female. So I definitely, it was really challenging, even though a lot of the fields I'm working, communication, sociology, public health, a lot of the spaces I've worked in are very female dominated. But it, it goes back to some of the things we've talked about over the years, right, is that representation is necessary but not sufficient if you haven't changed the culture and the incentive structure behind it. Um, so some of the actually the cruelest and most uh, beastly things that happened to me from a feminist perspective in terms of women eating their young were you know from other female faculty members who are supposed to be my mentors and who use mm. that for their own advantage or you know I, I can I can tell some really terrible stories of I, I recently had to do for my work at UK, like a, a retraining, a recertification on human subjects protection and ethics and research. And I was like, all the different scenarios that aren't supposed to happen. I was like, oh yeah, that happened, that happened, that happened. So I, I think, you know, it's, it, it's a woman in science thing for sure. And a different kind of like the, the age and the class things on top of it. But it's also how all women are forced to become socialized into a very, um, competitive and individually driven kind of way of thinking about knowledge production. You don't get to be collaborative. There's no, mm -hmm. or if you are collaborative, it's always a zero sum game of who gets what, right? It's not, it's so different than I think the way that we think of things in terms of um, how we team with each other, right? So it's definitely, even in feminist academic spaces, we don't operate as feminists uh, necessarily, right? And our practices right. with each other um, as knowledge producers and in the various different kinds of ranks. I, th that was my science article was basically, I call it my manifesto, right? Where I was just kind of saying, we're hypocrites. We say all these things, but we don't do them. So yeah, so yeah, I, yeah. It's, it's a lot of these kind of, a lot of intersectional kinds of wedges. And that's why I'm so excited about the work I'm getting to do with UK now on the underrepresented minority faculty, because it's really, NIH is finally recognizing for the first time that there are really deep systemic cultural barriers to advancement of people of color in the sciences, especially women of color. Um, and race is far more determining than even gender at this, this point, right? And, and that it's cultural, right? It's, it's, what, it's how these representations are playing out in how we interact with each other as peers and as colleagues that are causing this stuff. There ain't, there's nothing, they've tried to control for everything else, but this is, this is what we gotta fix. So 
it's definitely, you know, it, it's been kind of interesting now to kind of on the other side of my postdoc and all of that and really not wanting to participate in academia as a faculty member part of that that kind of hustle game and all that kind of thing um, to, to think about like where what, what a culture shock it was to me initially going from this journalism, the ideal of what the entrepreneurial self-made journalism to like, I, I just didn't know any of the, the power politics that come along with this, this stuff and, and how, how threatening and emasculating it would be for people to hear, think, hear authority and knowledge coming out of my mouth. You know, it's, it's really, it's, it's something very different than I don't think a journalist really, because you get to be the fly on the wall as a journalist, right? You're always yeah. not really part of the, the story or it, it's a different kind of um uh i don't know role shifting that you can do than than what academic academia involves and and i definitely felt it on multiple registers and it makes it gives me a big sensitivity for what it would be like to be experiencing academia as a first generation woman of color especially it like it doesn't get easier the first it gets harder the further up you go right the more accomplished you become the the gatekeepers all the implicit ways that that folks are 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 the, the folks get stratified here it gets even more intense at the top layers right so it's it's it was really a taste of some of the, the corruption and how the sausage is made but also an opportunity thinking of now that i've kind of learned that how can I help to reform some of these institutions and, and get to do some really cool things with the tools of institutional research? Yeah. Wow. Um, love the sausage reference. Thank you. <laughs> when, so I'm going to, I have kind of a big question, I think, um, that will sum up uh, several questions that I have. But when you first, so you saw a production of uh, the first year of the girl project in 2013 and i know at that time you were doing work and had done some evaluation of um the girl scouts yes and you came to us and i i think it was unclear um it wasn't unclear but it's not usually how artists are approached to say, I'm interested in what you're doing. I want to evaluate it. I want to m measure how it's affecting these young people. Um, I want to see the outcomes. This is going to take some time. I think it was similar work that you were doing with uh, the Girl Scouts, except ours was uh, our artistic in nature. I don't want to misspeak, but I think we, we were applying it as arts activism in a different way. Um, and then when we said, okay, <laughs> please do that, uh, you set up with, I think, in my understanding from you, is in your own way, ways to measure and evaluate differently than some standards that, that are already set up and long known in research methods. So how did you... How did you utilize the Girl Project as a way to measure these outcomes? How did you set up your research? How did you take uh, past participants of the Girl Project to help you create this research? I know it's a big question, but um, I think there's, I think it's all wrapped up into your move into working with us. Absolutely. Yeah, so I, I was originally working with the Girl Scouts because I was really interested in uh, a younger age group and when, um, when particularly girls started to develop or when people socialized to identify as female uh, uh, started to, uh, within kind of the, the feminist psychological literature, there's this really interesting theory around objectification. And one of the key points in this theory is is when you as an individual or the extent to which you as an individual internalize an outsider's perspective on yourself to start to see your body in particular the way that other people do monitoring and surveillance is kind of the terms for that kind of thing so i was really interested in when that switch kind of happened and when working with the girls scouts on we did some collaging and a lot of different interviews where the girls explained their collages of uh different media images and it became really clear there was a flip from fourth grade to fifth grade, right? It's a really interesting transition there. Uh, yeah, so um, 
So I, I had a, that was my child, uh, journal of children and media uh, article. So if anybody's interested, I would love to share. It's, I think it's called Becoming Tween Bodies was the article that we, we worked uh, on with that. But I was, as a performing person, right, when I saw the girl project, it was everything, again, like I said earlier, everything I would have wanted at that age. And what I, why I was involved with the girl project is because I was, in, or why I was involved with the Girl Scouts is because I was interested in, like I was saying earlier, understanding some of the forces and cultural um, processes that have had it affected me, but how much better to be able to be involved in something that was actually doing something about it in a way that I thought was, so it's this combination of media literacy helping girls to critique the ways, and, and that was so evident from the first performance, that this is all about really giving girls creative space to wrestle with and reinvent what they've received from the media, right? So that was so evident as a thing. And it was a performance thing. So I was just like, so the, the, the whole, and the opportunity again, to be part of, part of the solution and to really be, and part of the team as well. So most evaluators, the way that traditional research works is you have a program over here. And because if you have like some grant funding that requires you to have a program evaluation, you hire someone to come from the outside, some like person who does consulting, some academic who's asking for way too much money for what they're doing or having their grad, their grad student do for them, right? Most likely. Right. So, right. So this outside person comes in, sets up this kind of structure for what they think is happening in the program, comes up with different kinds of things to evaluate sometimes in different levels of consultation with the program. But for us, it was about, I mean, I was teaching yoga, teaching different aspects of what the program was and really integrally uh, involved in uh, grant writing around this program evaluation. So the program evaluation had a purpose for us. It was creating our, our next cycle of funding and, and that kind of momentum. Um, so that felt a lot more, that was what I was looking for in terms of my own research was a way to actually be, be able to make some kind of like meaningful impact with these skills, evaluate something in a way that would actually, you know, be useful for our grant funding purposes, but also mm -hmm. give us a clear sense of what was going on. So that was unusual about my research is that I'm an insider evaluator as opposed to an outsider. And you have to, there are pr various pros and cons of those, those kinds of things, all depending on how much you buy into like positivist bullshit about whether or not, like we all have biases, okay? Like it's whether or not you recognize that you're bringing them to the table. And that's one of the biggest, I think, mainstream ideas about science, right? Is that people are just totally divorced from, like the divorce between identity and what you study for a lot of people who aren't in like the critical side, like our gender women's studies people, our black uh, uh, th theory folks, all the folks who are working in those spaces are fantastic at bringing their subjectivity to the floor. But otherwise, people go into research because, I mean, because it's uh, the trendy, sexy topic to explore, because there's funding there, because their mentors do it. And it's, it's all this kind of what's in it for me thing. Mm. Um, so I, that's, that's some of what's uh, coming to play. And as far as the design goes, like the insider outsider dynamic, all of those ideas around objectivity and bias and the, that a lot of feminist scholars would agree with me are what we can best hope for is like a conscious subjectivity, right? We can't be objective even as journalists. That, that ideal always felt really ridiculous to me, but we can account for how our positionality, who we are in our background might influence what we're seeing and how and what we're missing, right? That's, that's the conscious subjectivity part. The other part of, of my work that was so different from how you typically do evaluation research um, is that instead of me coming in or me designing this as, a, 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 as an insider evaluator based on everything I know and all my relationships with you all and the access to data, everything that I could have done as an individual researcher all neat and tidy, I wanted to see how this actually impacted participants. Who better to involve that in that than alumni of the program, right? They have done this thing. Um, right. Right. So that was super. And also, so the way that this worked as a study, instead of me independently designing, like from the literature, what we want to uh, explore and investigate, how this program fits into it, how we're going to evaluate the outcomes related to that, the, the, that to topic of knowledge. Instead, I took it to these, these eight young women who said they'd like to work on this with me. Um, I took it to them and said, what is the girl project? 
That's what the question we started with. What is the girl project? After we talked a little bit about the difference between her, this kind of like male stream way of doing research and the participatory way, and, and what they started with in terms of what, of the girl, what is the girl project is so more expansive and cool and exciting and led in so many different directions that I as an individual researcher could never have, like their, their innovation was really bringing in the perspective of the audience members, all of the different kinds of voices that can help see what this is and even to look at networks, right? So who's in the audience as a, by virtue of how they're related to different performers, right? And so we did a whole network analysis part of this study um, because the girls said, hey, this is really important if we're trying to understand who is participating in this and why, right? So from the very beginning, from their de definition of what the girl project was to our kind of collaborative process of coming up with our research questions and the data collection uh, strategies, some of the girls even helped with collecting data. They did like field notes that came to the, the program and took different kinds of notes. Then we all got up together at the end and made sense of the binders full, I'll call them binders full of women. women. Do you remember that reference? Yeah. Um, so we had binders full of women that the girls got back together and did some highlighting coding around based on the coding scheme that they developed. And the coolest part of this whole thing, I think for me was continuing to work on the project with several of the girls in different capacities, but be able, being able to write an article with one of them as a co-author, as well as my research assistant at Tufts. Like, in addition to being able to generate all this interesting knowledge about what the Girl Project is and does, it was a way to build the next generation of, of maybe feminist social sciences scientists. These are all young women in the early stages of their undergrad, and I will not, I mean, you know these women, oh my goodness, they are sharp as, they will do whatever they want to in this world. And many of them had been given like the kind of STEM message that it's all about you, if you want to be serious, here's how you do it. And to be able to give them an experience of what a different kind of research can look like was really, was really its own cool thing in and of itself that, that can't be like, I can't even think about that in terms of the research outcomes, right? That's a, such a beautiful um, uh, part of the process. And um, yeah, so that's, that's, how it would maybe make the distinction is again this insider outsider thing and participatory versus a more kind of standard investigator led. The last thing I'll say about this is one of you know one of the things that's so exciting to me about the opioid overdose uh, prevention grant that I'm on now this massive NIH study which tells you something about the trends the ways that research is going that NIH has put I mean we have 87 million dollars at UK to do this thing over four years and that's there are three other sites that have similar levels of funding. This is a pure participatory process. They have a community-led coalition that they are paying to be engaged with making decisions about what's happening in their counties around opioid uh, uh, education, the naloxone distribution treatment. So I, I'm really hopeful that this kind of participatory way of doing work is, is on the ascendance because it, it works on so many other levels besides producing results to evaluate what happened, right? It's it's community organizing and community development and investment in people and capacity and all of that. Really interesting to me because I, I guess I had never really made that connection that it, it was something that was unique that, that as a researcher that you were in the project as well. And that that is really really cool, and I had no idea that that was something that that would be unique in that way. Um, so how lucky are all of us that 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 was something that we were we were able to to do? It, yeah, did it make it? Does it make it hard when when you have an emotional investment to look at something um, from a critical perspective or a measurements and outcomes, but you also have such a strong emotional investment for, for it to show certain outcomes that this is working. Well, how do you, how do you divide from that emotional participatory aspect to the science research part of it? I try to keep the same continuity of, again, this kind of conscious subjectivity, recognizing that I can't bracket away all of my own investments in different kinds of success. And the way, I think the best way that participatory research does that is by including so many different perspectives that you mm. cannot maintain the, the delusion that you know what the hell is going on. 
you know, <laughs> yeah. like, especially if you've got a group of like teenage women who, you know, pretty well, they are not going to like, they will tell you. Right. And if you give, and so it creating, I call it kind of falsifiability as part of the process. It gives you opportunities to be proven wrong if you create them. Right. Um, so I think that's kind of the, the key is finding ways to bring, and I think that's part of what we're doing with the evolution of uh, Voices Amplified is how to bring in, in, in research we call it triangulation. Like every, every way of seeing is improved by adding a third angle, right? It's how you verify a source. And that's also a journalism thing too, right? You need right. to have multiple kinds of sources looking at, um, and even in sociology, we talk about the difference between objective reality and intersubjective reality. So objective reality is what STEM folks are studying, right? How the universe works. Intersubjective reality is how we all know that, um, you know, bourbon, horses, and basketball are Kentucky, right? That's, that is th our reality that we've agreed upon in terms of culture, right? That's, that's a different kind of thing to study because you're, you're part of it. And if you can bring more voices to the table, then I think your vantage point is a little bit less. It's, it's harder to get into um, those, that kind of blinders mode to a certain extent. I think another part of it, as hard as it is to move from like lived experience with disordered eating, with thinking about so many of these kinds of issues in my, my own life, and also my investment in this program and the work that we've done and the impact it's had on girls, to move from that to like kind of a, um, a more detect it's all on a continuum um mm. and as hard as that can be sometimes as a gear shift i think it's the only way to do this stuff because if you don't like for example with opioid uh we have lots of folks with lived experience or families with lived or like their family members with lived experience on the healing kentucky's team i don't think you can do justice to this stuff if you don't have lived experience with some aspect of the research because then you're deluding yourself into thinking that you can be objective when you just are detached and 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 not invested in the you have to be invested in the outcomes right otherwise you're just extracting data for your own your right. own benefit you know right so um this is an impossible question and i actually think uh, you talking about uh, co-writing a paper with um, one of the Girl Project alumni might be the answer to this question. I was, I, but what, so just like in one experience, can you identify a favorite moment that is crystal clear to you in your memory over the past? It's an impossible question, but that is a favorite memory or a moment that hit you extra hard in all the positive ways um that you can identify oh, there's this one picture of i think before jenny joined us but it's all three of us with the lees town uh one of our first lees town performances with some of our our tried and true uh alumni serving as mentors all of us just smiling and holding our roses and wearing our girl project like it was at the after a performance where these girls had shared what they had developed with uh, the other girls in their their grade, and we were all together and got to and and of course the performance was I mean it was beautiful but it was a mess right <laughs> as these things always I mean this was not a the kind of production that we see with the high school girl project or of course like you know voices heard but it was so I just standing up there with all of you together it that that picture just that's it right wow. That's great. Yeah. And I, we all know exactly what picture you're yep. talking about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think uh, I'm wearing this shirt too. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, the, the work, I, I think Vanessa and I both talked about this um, in our interview, but the work is, can be particularly um, draining just on how much empathy and love and care we all want to take and all put into this work and, and i there's a lot of rewards with the girl project because we see the change we have the girls they have a performance they get an audience the audience is always so generous and giving standing ovations and a lot of love for our participants and that moves me into some of the work and evaluation you were doing um, with CASA, which I think is incredibly complicated, uh, challenging work, 
And um, how can you talk to us about CASA and what you do there, what CASA does, and how you how you pursued that work, and if it was difficult daily to let go of some of the work you were doing and be home and be centered. Yeah, well, the first thing I'll say in going into all of that is that we're, this is something we've got to recognize as a state in Kentucky, if you are a Kentuckian listening to this, we have the highest rate of child maltreatment in the country. Uh, out of all of the states in the country, when, when you think about a substance, the opioid disorder, that, that, that's why I'm working with kind of opioid use disorder in this. I, I was able to be recruited because I see this as being such a contributing causal factor to the really intense kind of intergenerational dynamics of, of course, trauma, but also just deep poverty, systemic disinvestment, and, and, and substance use disorder as a coping, generational coping mechanism to deal with, with that. Um, so, the, the, the work of CASA and the work of our social workers who are on the front lines every single day trying to figure out how the heck to do this work in the middle of a pandemic, how to do family preservation, reunification, when and how to deal with removals, which are the greatest tragedy that you experience every time if you're working one of these, these abuse and neglect cases. In Kentucky, fortunately, we have a new commissioner who's really, her research actually focused, she was the director of the Intimate Partner Violence a Shelter in Louisville for years and also a social work professor at um, uh, Eastern Kentucky University. Her whole research focus is on secondary trauma for social workers, right? So there's a big recognition, I would say, in the, the caring fields and the folks who are doing this kind of frontline work that we've got to do something about this. This is not sustainable to put and, and we, we have highly educated, amazingly trained, very confident social workers who are carrying three times the caseload that is recommended. You're dealing with 60 to 80 families with highly complex issues, right? And so um, first thing I'll say is, I, again, I'm glad that there is some attention now being paid in the state toward, and someone at the helm of, of Child Protective Services or DCBS is the Division of uh, Child and Family uh, Services. Uh, that uh, that provides the that that work. There's someone at the helm there who really knows what secondary trauma is and can deal with it. Because everything I've experienced is all secondhand to a certain extent. What what we do with CASA is, um, and I, I served on both the local level and the state level, to train community volunteers to be able to help bring some humanity to the courtroom. You're dealing with social workers who are working 60 to 80 cases. Can barely, I mean, again, highly complex cases, right? And attorneys who are also mostly uh, a court appointed, so public defenders, huge caseloads, these families become numbers, you know, these children become numbers. And ACASA brings the full story of who this family is and can do the information gathering through the court order that they receive from the judge to be able to access different kinds of confidential information and put together a report for all the parties in the court about what's the actual situation with these kids on a medical, a psychological, emotional level, all of the different kinds of factors that uh, we know are really influential in, in uh, children having res building resilience to deal with this incredibly uh, and, and, and this is another really exciting thing about um, the world of abuse and neglect work right now is that um, there's, it, it's, we're shifting away from punitive ideas of, about a family that is experiencing substance use disorder and mental health is a family to fix and we will take the children away and fix the family and see if we can put them back together. There's a recognition that I think is pretty much across the board that wasn't the case a few years ago even that removal is its own form of trauma. And this is now even federal legislation. And, new, and there's new uh, legislation called Family First that is redirecting funds for prevention and actually investing in families uh, with different kinds of services as opposed to all like different kinds of removals and placements. So, um, you know, I've been involved, I've, I've been a hotline volunteer for um, domestic violence shelters since I, since undergrad, right, I've been involved in different kinds of volunteer capacities in um, women's services in the past, but CASA was really my uh, first uh, experience with casework and um, now continuing to have kind of front row seat, the opioid epidemic in Kentucky. I think the most important thing 
is to for in terms of like this what we're talking about with secondary trauma here and the ways that the field is shifting to recognize the reality of that for um, the folks who are caring for for these families and the realities of trauma here is to treat yourself with um, with this isn't just work this isn't just being productive and putting in your time you are holding trauma for other people and when you're in that kind of that that kind of neutral healing space, you've got to give yourself not just time, like not just time to recover, but time to um, time to re heal from the trauma that you've internalized and kind of taken on. Right. And I think mm -hmm. that that's, that's something we don't always think about when we talk about work life balance or self care and this kind of thing is that what you're doing in the caring professions when you're when you're on the front lines of, of trauma is it's an energy deficit beyond just a productivity thing. So I, I think recognizing and giving yourself different kinds of rituals that allow you to shed um, some of that. So for me, it's different using my aura in different ways, as corny as it sounds, like activating my aura to go into different kinds of spaces and feel like I have my own space and my own kind of sense of, of boundary. And even as I'm holding space for other people, I'm not taking it totally on, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's a big part of it in the moment. Um, but after the fact, it's giving myself time to journal and process the same way I would with my own kinds of traumas, right? Give any trauma that you don't process becomes a stuck place that you'll have to deal with later. So just giving yourself time not to dissociate from it or to ruminate on it, to, but to be really present to what you've experienced and journal about it. That was really helpful for, for me with, with all of this and, and where my mindful, and again, back to my original theme, Please, have you considered a mindfulness practice? You'll love it, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it, it really does give you that space to not be in the moment, but reflect on what it's it it it's taken from you because it has it has a toll, you know. It, it and and if we pretend like it doesn't and continue with this productivity mindset, uh, I I just I, I think we have to recognize that this is a different kind of of a quantum kind of work almost, you know. Yeah, that's interesting. It reminds me um, just talking about the stuck place and keeping that toxicity in your body or experiencing it and not knowing it. I think in applying it to the arts, that's a lot of the work you're doing as an actor in grad school. They're looking for your stuck places because you cannot safely be a vessel for human experience if you have your own stuck places. And it's very hard to be an individual carrying traumas that you have ignored for a long time because those can come up in your work, you know? So um, I think it's the same in families, in relationships, things come up that you didn't know were there, didn't know that they were going to be triggered. And um, yeah, I think you helped us do some of that work with the Girl Project too in um, talking to the woman at UK about just meditating and taking care of ourselves as we're holding space for challenging, challenging stories. Uh, wow. So yes, your, your body of work that you do professionally is incredible. I think we have the privilege, all of us, of seeing, um, of seeing vulnerabilities in each other. You know, we, they come out inevitably when we're spending Im immense amounts of time together. But I don't think maybe people who see Margaret as a, you know, leadership team of the Girl Project really see your vulnerable side a lot. You know, you have, we call you the rock crusher for a reason. <laughs> um, and so I wonder what makes you feel vulnerable? What, what, what do you face or what are the vulnerabilities that you don't think people see? Mm, I think this is, this is such one of the most interesting questions from the list because it's definitely something I've been growing with and through. I think part of intimacy and relationship is share, being able and willing to share the vulnerabilities and the hard stuff and knowing that you're not burdening. So something, something I've always valued about our dynamic is the ability to bring our vulnerabilities and our overreactions and our misinterpret all of that gets to be part of who we are together as opposed to kind of a sanitized uh, kind of uh, a space of performance or self-presentation. So I, I think 
Girl Project has been great for me in terms of, of having a team environment in which I feel like I can give my all professionally, but also show warts and all how it's affecting me, right? Because that's what really, what, like, and, and something I've, you know, kind of experienced in the past is, um, uh, you know, kind of the need to know, people are looking for how, how I sweat, right? They're looking for the vulnerability or mm, how the I chink sweat. in the armor, right? Mm -hmm. You know, right? They want to see me sweat. They want to see and, and, and use that. And, and some of this comes from, again, my own kind of uh, emotional traumas growing up. And I don't want to go into, of course, too much detail around the, uh, the, the coping that I was doing around with my eating disorder. That's, that's a conversation for my therapist. Um, you all are not my, uh, my processors here. But I, I will say, too, um, something that's been, been really cool for me in doing this kind of trauma work is not only like cognitive behavioral therapy, I've been doing more um, EMDR and some of the different kinds of trauma processing stuff that's out there. So I would encourage anybody who's like feeling um, struck by some of the things that Ellie and I were saying around um, secondary trauma and care for stuck places. If, if that's resonating with you, it, EMDR, it's, it's a way to really work with the emotions that come with those stuck places and not just the cognitions and, and give it that light and that consciousness and the presence that allows you to actually feel through that kind of stuff. Um, Can so, you explain for our listeners and for me what EMDR is? <laughs> so uh, it's, oh gosh, uh, I, I can't even remember what it stands for. It's like eye desensitiz desensitization movement, rapid movement therapy. So okay. if, if you do EMDR, um, it's, it's using different kinds of patterns of gaze with your therapist while you're holding different kinds of images or experiences that might have been traumatizing but you've already set up ahead of time your different safe spaces so you can easily return back to what your body feels like what your emotions feel like in a memory of safe place while you go with your therapist through these different kinds of somatic techniques to explore some emo combinations of emotions and thoughts that are are stuck places for you for whatever reason so I, my therapist does a version of EMDR called havening, um, where you use, it's called the touch, you touch your hands together like this, and the, and from yoga, we know that all of our, you know, of course, our nervous endings of all of our meridian points, hands are so super important for our energetic body, so rubbing the hands together keeps you really present in your body and engaged with all of your senses while you're experiencing a trauma as it as it comes through your body, right? So you're staying in in your sensory body while your body's memory is going back through these these other things. So, like all of the EMDR stuff, the way I understand it, is about really using your body's ability to heal, and with with the help of a therapist who's who is trained to help you define and create. Um, your safe places and your reference points before you go into the, the ouchy spots, right? You've got to have someone. And the other part of what I do with um, this kind of therapy is identifying, um, it's called family systems. So identifying some of the different kinds of needs that are, um, are part of my own identity. So I have my inner dad, my inner grandma, my inner mom, who all have their own kinds of scripts around trauma that we're unpacking. So it's helping to understand who we're healing even, you know? Um, and so, so that's kind of the distinction there as opposed to, and I've done a lot of cognitive behavioral, I am such a behavioral health pro from eating disorder days. I'm so, I'm, I, I, I could talk, I could spin such a story for my therapist when I was a teenager. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> But CBT is all about talking yourself through it, and that's great and really helpful. But what if you like trauma is in our bodies? It's mm -hmm. in it's in our souls, and that's and EMDR helps us to to get at the wisdom for for healing where those those injuries and stuck places are. Mm -hmm. So do you, you feel like up on? Oh, you can look it up on Psychology Today by specialization too, if you're interested in finding like a provider who does that. That's like one of the drop down options, and, and you can look for someone. It's I just Googled it. To, kind of prevalent. Yeah. Yeah, I was Googling it to see if there was a quick answer, and it's like, need, a, need the therapist in Atlanta? And I'm like, oh, wait. Um, I just <laughs> wanted a definition. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's everywhere if you just Google it. It's fascinating just looking at it for a second. Um, while, while you were talking about it. Do you feel like uh, people have a perception of you um, 
that that is common that you know oh people always say this about me you know this is what people think i am uh and do you think that it aligns with who you are do you feel like your people's perception of you and who you are uh, fundamentally lines up it depends so and i realized i kind of didn't really answer your question around the like i was got so excited talking about the emdr stuff and being comfortable <laughs> around sharing vulnerability I think a vulnerability that people might not know about me is the extent to which, I mean, uh, right, eating disorders are all about fear of rejection, and uh, and that's that's some of the original stuff that I'm getting at with a lot of you know the the therapy and all of that. But every time I'm submitting an article, I mean, how many like I still feel the the threat of of being pushed aside because I'm too much, right? Like I'm just too much to handle and Margaret's too intense, um, too extra, right? And so, you know, yeah, just like extra as the kids say, right? Yes. So I, I think this kind of um, uh, the, the rejection element that is, maybe I got into this kind of work partially is like, you know, exposure therapy to build up my tolerance for what, what this can feel like um, to put yourself out there but as much as I put myself out there, as people see me putting myself out there in all these different kinds of spaces, it's an intent, it takes a, a toll on, on me um, because there's so much ingrained fear, less so the more I meditate and the more I, I ground and source, right? Um, but there's so much at fear um, at stake for me and so much insecurity when it comes to putting myself out there in these different kinds of spaces that I don't think people necessarily see or understand because i mean it's hopefully my my thing to work on but I, I feel like i've also gotten better in the you know the last few years with with sharing some of those insecurities with folks to to help normalize it right like and that's something i think that you know we do a lot of young people such a disservice with in education when we're all about achievement and merit gosh the best thing that we can i mean i didn't learn how to fail i was always number one super per, and no one challenged me no one wanted to help me you know experience learning as anything other than you know this kind of uh gold star system right i didn't mm -hmm. i didn't really get pushed on these things and i think it's because we are so oriented to think of it like the a is is the, the best, but what, what, what have we actually, how have we learned and grown and what opportunities have we given children to fail and get up again and keep going, right? That's, that's not necessarily something I, as a kid who was high achieving, I thought that my worth was all about continuously achieving. And if I, if I was not, so every performance was just, every A plus was what I had to do, right? Like there was no, there's no real kind of sense of, um, accomplishment it was the requirement and the fear of falling short or rejection right is just so intense when we think about performance and learning and all these kinds of things and in the ways that we often we often do um so as far as like what the difference between i, I think people would be surprised at the extent to which i'm really an introvert i really am an introvert as much as i again I'm, I'm out there and engaged in the world in a lot of different ways we define introvert and extrovert by where we get our energy i get my energy from being in my little like cocoon here with the doggies and my honey and meditating and being quiet and reading and that's that is definitely not when i'm channeling and energetic and engaged in the world it seems almost i think people don't understand how that could be possible, but right. I, I'm very much an introvert at heart. And I think, you know, in some ways it, it, it's, it's been interesting how much introverts have, I think a lot of introverts I know have really relished this past year. And of course, extroverts, some extroverts I know are just like dying on the vine, you know, this is, I think it's been a really uh, interesting way that this year has provided for us to evaluate where, where we are getting our energy and, and are we really as introverted or extroverted as we thought, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, so if, if that answers your question, to try to go back and circle back and get the other one, and the other, and then this this last one is that I, I definitely am a total hermit and um, a, a monastic, right? That's the the spiritual yeah, yeah. version of that. So, what are yeah. you reading right now? What are you reading that you feel like is? And maybe you're sharing it with us in the campfire, or, um, but what what are you reading, or what books have you read that you would recommend two or three books for folks? 
So I am reading right now, this is something I've been teaching from quite a bit in my yoga classes that I offer online every week through Centered Yoga Studio, fantastic local studio here in town. Um, uh, this book, uh, Wild Mercy by Mirabai Starr on the uh, living the fierce and tender wisdom of the women mystics across uh, different religious traditions, right? So it's kind of her personal and um, literary exploration of some of the different qualities and figures that embody the divine feminine and the mystical qualities of the divine feminine in particular. It's super beautiful. Mm. Um, I'm also reading, I am reading uh, a book about uh, the uh, meaning of Mary Magdalene. So basically the fact that the, the, the first disciple, the disciple who is actually the witness to every element of the passion story is totally, she's not even one of the 12 disciples and really no accident that she's a she that's often associated with prostitution, right? So this story is kind of about uh, reclaiming Mary Magdalene as a mystical figure and kind of the teachings that have been excavated through the Nag Hammadi uh, discoveries, Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Mary Magdalene, and um, uh, uh, Gospel, oh, I'm forgetting the last one. The, the, they're called the Gnostic Gospels. Often people think about them as the Gnostic Gospels, but that's kind of a, a misnomer in some ways. Won't go into it too technical, but this book is kind of about reclaiming what the Nag Hammadi Gospels tell us and connecting it with what the canonical Gospels tell us about who Mary Magdalene actually was as the kind of counterpart sacred feminine to Christ, right? So I'm, I'm very interested, and this is by a feminist Episcopal priest, right? She's totally awesome. I, I love both of these authors. Um, the other book, what, what else am I reading? I always have like five things on my stack. I'm reading a biography of Audre Lorde. Um, it's called mm. Warrior, um, mm -hmm. a poet. Um, that's just really beautiful. So um, I, that's, I definitely recommend that. I'm also listening to um, a, it, a, an audio book on, uh, 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 it's the Glennon Doyle one, uh, Untamed, Untamed. Or whatever. I just, mm -hmm. start, I just started that and that's a big you know, bestseller right now. So I just got that audio book. I can't remember, it might've been one of you guys who suggested that. So I anyway, just started that book because everybody is like- Untamed, Jenny was Untamed. obsessed. She's like, get this on your book list. Yeah. It was my yeah. therapist. That's who told me I had to read it anyway. So yeah. So those are my, my current books. So some a decent, lately I've been just reading as much feminist theology and kind of um, marginalized perspective. I'm really interested in how, you know, <laughs> uh, black Americans and uh, American Indians have, how you can reconcile basically the slaver religion and the colonizers religion with any kind of your, and, and there's really beautiful work that's uh, decolonizing work that's going on in these spaces, but how can, how is, how can we reclaim Christianity as the religion of the oppressed, which is what it origin, originally is and, and was, right? So I've just been reading a lot of different cool, like stuff from those perspectives. And it's, it's, um, it's kind of cool for me to read feminist stuff that isn't, and, and it's a theology space as opposed to like gender and women's studies space where we're looking at exploring social realities, right? But this is kind of an academic take on spirituality, which for me has always been much more experiential. So mm. that, that's what I'm reading right now. Lots of good girl power stuff. Nice. <laughs> if you could have a billboard that was all over America, what would the billboard say? Wear your mask. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay. Oh gosh, it's so Just simple, kidding. isn't it? <laughs> What's the most? Cloth. What? Say that again. I said it's just a little piece of cloth. That's oh, all. And Jenny reminds us, and wear it over your nose. <laughs> mm -hmm. Over your mm -hmm. nose. Um, what's the most valuable piece of advice anyone's ever given you? Don't hide your light under a bushel. Uh, I. That was, yeah. So it's this a song, is a, isn't it? Isn't there a little song? <laughs> this little light of mine. I'm gonna, I'm let, gonna it let it shine. shine. Yep. Yep. <laughs> we both grew up in Methodist churches. Indeed. Churches. <laughs> yep. All the same kids' songs. So, but this, this, I heard it from this female engineer. This is my first professional job, um, and she uh, was in a very male dominated office. And this is a very conservative Eastern Oregon. Our first job out of grad school was out in Eastern Oregon. And she could already start to see some of the ways that I was 
accommodating and trying to manage all the men's perceptions and all this kind of stuff and by minimizing myself, right? Some of those things about power and authority in the research environment that I was talking about. And she told me when I, when we were leaving for this job in Kentucky, don't hide your light under the bushel. You got to let that shine. And coming from her, from a woman who had occupied a really challenging space, you know, she was pretty senior in her career. She'd been working with the, in this dynamic for like 20, 30 years. And that, that meant a lot to, to hear that from someone who's so courageous and brave and had weathered far more rejections and slights than I can even imagine in that, 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 that pioneering work. I've got to ask you this question. Um, I, I really was going to go to this last question that we love. What is your superpower? But I have to put that on hold for a second. I have become, you know, you're my friend. So I call you Margaret. And building websites or talking about new ways of maybe pursuing our bios or interviewing this person that Voices Amped listeners doesn't know, I'm like, Dr. Margaret McGladry, right? Like, this is our doctor. Um, and this entire conversation, and I, I think one of the books you just referenced, you quoted online in response to Jill Biden being attacked on using doctor before her name. So I'm just interested in your perspective as a doctor, um, how you how you how you responded to that attack on Dr. Jill Biden. And um, do you experience that? Is it weird for you to put that before your own name? It, it occurred to me that you've never asked us to put that before your name. And it also occurred to me, it should never have to be asked. It, it exists before your name now. So I just wonder what your thoughts are on that. That's really interesting, Ellie. And I think, you know, so much of that, and it's absolutely, it goes back to the young female and not from the academic class thing, right? Is that um, any, it is assumed that I am not doctor. And so my email signature is very deliberate. Um, and because I'm working in U at UK, even in this kind of like pr project management capacity, very different than a faculty kind of role, the assumption is that unless you tell them otherwise, faculty don't treat staff like, or anybody else like other faculty, right? Even if you have the credentials. So there's a certain amount of the annoying signaling that you have to do. Um, and also, you know, kind of how you want to tell students to refer to you because you want to convey to students, there's a value in higher education. Like call me Dr. McLadry because like when you're done with this, you want this degree to have its own kind of value, right? Or, you know, it's, it's about the process that you're recognizing. Um, but that's very different. I feel like the use of doctor in a space where people should know better, like academia, where people know what that means and why and how we, we use the doctor uh, honorific and, and how, um, that's a lot different as a power play than it is working with like kids from first generation homes who'd have no idea what like the letters after your name, name mean. And also in like different kinds of community contexts where like you coming in wa waving your flag of all of your like credentials and experiences and stuff just create a, like more of a gulf between what you're, between the lived experience of the person you're trying to engage with and where you come from. So like coming to like in different kinds of community, con I would never ask one of the girls to call me Dr. McGladry or whatever. It's all about the kind of power, who holds the power in the situation. And if it's in a space where doctor is meaningful, then you better call me Dr. McGladry. But if it's in a community context um, and it's, it's about reducing power differentials and trying to, to shed some of those institutional um, uh, kind of weapons that I try to, you know, take from the rich and use for the poor <laughs> to a certain mm -hmm. extent, right? Um, like to, once you've gotten into a position where you can be of meaningful use to different kinds of communities, you better let go about of all that, that, that crap, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, chances are you're not only going to be asking people to call you something that they don't, don't understand, but if you explain it, you're going to like sound like patronizing, right? Like what this degree is. Honestly, the whole Jill Biden thing just revealed to me how little people know about higher education, period, right? That an EDD is a doctoral degree, is a terminal degree in a field of study, that actually medical doctors stole the term doctor 
from PhDs, which is the original doctor through kind of the medieval credential ac academy. So medical doctors got the name doctor from PhDs, right? So it just, to me, it really speaks to kind of the death of expertise that a lot of commentators have described in our, our culture right now, that we really don't even know what, what that, and only 2% of the population has a, a PhD, right? So, but it's not even valued as a thing, right? We're, the experts are the enemy, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> wow. Thanks for that. Um, so what is your superpower? Mm. Oh, gosh. My superpower is word and love. I was talking about that the other day in the context of writing a spiritual autobiography for my discernment process. So I think my, the, the superpower of word is the ability to listen, write, hear, be able to make sense of verbal information. I've been like, my mom will tell you, I've been talking, like I was still nursing and I was like, ask, I was like, nursing please, or I've been talking my whole life, my, my poor parents, right? Just talking their ears off. So word, and also like love, just the, uh, the, that's been something I've come to embrace about my skills and talents, that it's not really about what I produce or what I generate or what I achieve. It's about the relationships that I can give love through, you know, that's, um, and I, I, I feel that I have a, a, one of my gifts is to have a strong capacity for love, for seeing the positive in people, all of the different opportunities for, for growth and renewal and change and transformation. So love, word, those are my two. I love that. Great. Um, so this is our campfire section and we haven't gotten our sound effect, but uh, Vanessa's suggested some crackling or um, it's our campfire moment for our guests to share something that is inspirational to them. Um, to us, the campfire represents the power of storytelling, which is what we do, tell people stories um, in an intimate setting. And in our activism work, we refer to it as the closed container or circling. Um, which is where we create an intimate, safe space for our girls. So, Margaret, we would love for you to share something with us. What are you going to share? I'm going to share a passage from the book I mentioned uh, in my, my list here, Wild Mercy, Living the Fierce and Tender Wisdom of the Women Mystics by Mirabai Star. It's the opening uh, little poetry piece to this, this lovely little uh, collection of vignettes of these qualities of the divine uh, uh, mystic feminine. It says, prayer to the Shekinah. O Shekinah, yours is the feminine face of the holy, the luminous moon who lights up the night as we travel from captivity to liberation, the pillar of fire who guides our way home, the cloud hovering over the mountain peaks, living sign that the drought is over. You are the indwelling presence of the divine. Whenever we gather to praise the one, you are here in our midst. When we cry out for justice, you make our hearts tender. When we stand with those on the margins, you make our legs strong. When we create works of art and parent our children and harvest our gardens, you guide and sustain us. You are the Sabbath queen, the great mother who sits at the heart of the table, tearing off hunks of the secret bread that contains the exact flavor each of us loves best. You feed us all the proud and the repentant, the believer and the skeptic from your own hands. Your unconditional forgiveness dissolves otherness. O Shekinah, we are the vessel for your inflowing. Your radiance requires the clay of our embodiment. Your flame burns at the core of the earth. Your warmth penetrates the seedbed and animates the seedlings. Bless the head of every animal and kiss the tear-streamed face of humanity. You're the vision that builds community and you are our refuge when the fabric of community unravels. Be with us now as we navigate this landscape of mystery where your most cherished attributes, wild mercy and boundless compassion, righteousness and wisdom seem to be cast aside and trampled by imperious world powers and we are paralyzed by helplessness. Help us. May we remember you and lift you up. May we recognize your face and celebrate your beauty in everything and everyone, everywhere, always. Amen. 
Wow. What, will you show us the cover of that book again and tell us the title of it? Wild, Wild Mercy. Mercy. Wild Mercy. Yes. Wow. Yes. That was lovely. Thank you for sharing that, Margaret. Mm -hmm. Margaret, are you ready for your rapid response questions? <laughs> ready as I'll ever be. Bring it. Remember, these are rapid. <laughs> I don't know that they have to be rapid, rapid, you know, but all right, here we go. They're surprises. If you could choose another profession, what would you be? Mm, a diplomat. Oh, I love that was nice and rapid. That was great. <laughs> if you could have wisdom or riches, which would you choose? Oh, wisdom every time. Come on. <laughs> Your attitude to the world in one word. Uh, optimistic. Okay, good. Um, what is your first thought in the morning? I feel my breath. Nice, nice, okay. Who is the one person you think should be brought back from the dead? Ruth Bader Ginsburg. You know what? When I asked Ellie that question, I was like, I can't believe you're not saying Ruth Bader Ginsburg. The <laughs> only reason I didn't say Ruth Bader Ginsburg is because Jenny had said Ruth Bader Ginsburg. But what's funny is I think all four of us would all bring right. fucking bring Ruth Bader back. Ginsburg back. Bring her back. Bring her back. Yes. <laughs> okay. What would you be doing with your life if money was no issue? Traveling the world, seeing everything in God's good creation. That's a diplomat thing, too. Mm, yes. And last one, probably the most important one. <laughs> Choose one. Rom-com, documentary, action, or thriller? Mm, action. <laughs> That's what I, I said. I'm so shocked. I, <laughs> wow. I, I'm so shocked because I think maybe people would think that maybe action would be the one for me that I'd be like, yeah, action. And I assume for both of you, it would be documentary, <laughs> documentary, definitely. And then maybe thriller. And I was shocked as hell when, when Ellie said action and you're saying action. I'm just shocked. Like, cause, and I will be the first to admit like documentary is probably on the bottom of my list. And then I'd say thriller or and I love romantic comedy. It's like I'm a big fat dork when it comes to but I don't like action movies. I action movies make me crazy. Well, I see a documentary is what I should say, and that's like a work <laughs> and learning thing. But when it comes to just like having like I, I just blow it all up, right? You know, <laughs> it's that's that's fine. Pew pew pew. Let's let's see. Because uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I would put thriller though probably at the bottom of my list. I just don't like the scary stuff, especially the psychological <laughs> things. I have no. bad dreams. This is also you know? the person who likes to sleep in haunted houses, so it's fine. I love thrillers. <laughs> and actions are so nice because, you know, we're so busy all the time, and it's just nice to watch somebody be busier than you, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. You've got big problems, buddy. <laughs> Good luck with that. Yes. Oh, um, Margaret, thank you. You uh, oh. bring so much to the table and I don't know how lucky all of us were to collide in our space that we get to share, but I think we are very lucky and gifted to have collided. Um, you, me, Vanessa, Jenny, uh, and do the work we love to do. So thank you for being that person who collided with us and for sharing with us and giving us all your wisdom. Well, thank you for creating this beautiful space and co-creating it as, as with everything, just making, making space for, for all more and uh, more people, more love, more creativity. I love you both. And I'm just really proud of, um, of this new endeavor and, and evolution.
It's exciting. Love you too. Love you, Margaret. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thanks for getting amped with us. If there are questions that we didn't ask that you want answered, be sure to send them our way. We are Voices Amped on Instagram and Facebook. I don't think we have a Twitter, but you know, there's two other ways that you can get in contact with us. So we'll be good, right? Voices Amped is part of the arts initiative, Voices Amplified. You can check us out on our website at www.voicesamplified.net. Our team is Ellie Clark, Vanessa Becker-Weig, me, Jenny Benavides, and Dr. Margaret McGladry, with production assistance by alumni and intern Kennedy Johnson. This podcast is possible in part due to a generous grant from the Kentucky Foundation for Women. We want to thank Lauren Rourke for the badass podcast art, Tiffany DuPont Novak for our Fierce Voices Amplified logo, and Vanessa Davis for our beautiful underscore, I'm doing okay. You can check out her music at Songwriter Vanessa on Instagram. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we hope to see you next week. Voices Amped is generously sponsored by the Kentucky Foundation for Women. For more information about our guests, podcast content, or if you want to learn more about Voices Amplified, follow our advocacy work or support our 2021 independence campaign. You can visit our website, voicesamplified.net, or visit us on Facebook or Instagram. And remember, be curious, be courageous, take up space, and make some noise.